question. Have you ever had to pay a bill? Sure you have. I mean, you're not some maiden and or muchacho goober living rent-free in your parents' house while you write the rich kids guide the revolution on your medium account. Or 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 maybe maybe you are. Just just pay attention anyway, bucko. Also, you, you need to throw your folks a few bills every now and again. But what I'm getting at is, if you've ever had to pay anything larger than a drive through receipt, chances are you had to give some stranger your social security number, just pray it wouldn't fall into the hands of some maiden and or muchacho less goober living rent-free. And Y'all y- 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 get where this is going, man. Well, unfortunately, if one of those bill collectors so happened to be AT&T, then there's a chance you were one of the 70 million people who had that and a ton more personal information leaked onto the dark web. And now you're stuck going back and forth with the bank explaining why you would never take out a loan to start a soft round wrestling promotion in Uganda. Oh, and don't think that just because you don't use AT&T yourself that you're free of this ruckus bucko. Because if you have a friend or a family member who uses that carrier, then whenever they texted you or called you, your info is out there too. So it explains all of those warranty calls that you're getting now. And that's where today's sponsor Aura comes in. Aura will alert you if they find your phone number or any other sensitive information of yours has been compromised. And they give you fast fraud alerts if anyone tries to use that data to access your credit or bank accounts. You'll also get things like transaction monitoring, a VPN, antivirus, a password manager, parental controls, and identity theft insurance. And you get this all in one app at one affordable price. You can also use their call assistant which will pick up unknown calls and screen them for spam or scams or any of that nonsense so yeah i said all of that to make the point that you should go to aura.com slash little bill today and get your free two-week trial or you can just click the link in the description below bucko again that's aura.com slash little bill protect your neck and your pockets don't blame me if you don't i'm not gonna feel sorry for you i might laugh though keep it a buck but what can i say i'm a horrible human being All right, so if you grew up near a park in a predominantly black neighborhood, chances are you've seen this guy before. And if you haven't, it's because you've never had the house break a puppy at five in the morning before you missed the school bus and wound up having to catch the city, John, at the same time of day as all of the night junkies and day shift managers. Two Americas indeed, folks. And if you were anything like me, then you have at least one uncle who learned broken Mandarin from watching sub VHS tapes of Enter the Dragon and 36 Chambers of the Shaolin. And if you're also like me and happen to be that uncle's favorite nephew, he bought you your first pair of nunchucks from the flea market that you never really learned how to use because they wound up getting confiscated because you tried to use them in a fight at school one time. I won that fight, by the way without the nunchucks ask about me what i'm saying is black people have had for at least as long as i've been alive a pretty well established infatuation with east asia specifically martial arts more specifically kung fu an infatuation that some might say is being reciprocated in the last half decade or so can't say i'm flattered though More specifically, Kung Fu has pervaded and influenced much of black popular culture since the 70s at least, from movies to music to fashion. So much so that it's become one of the closest things we'll probably ever get to a respectful trope in popular media. I don't know, maybe this is just my way of caping for Leroy from Tekken. Like, look at this nigga. He's the bossest thing to ever be made. Like steel. Right? But why though? Why Kung Fu specifically? Especially considering the, let's just call it tension that has existed historically between black and Asian people within the inner cities of America. Now, this is not going to be that video. Farm Man has actually already done that video. So I suggest that y'all go over there and watch that if that's what you came here for. Rather, I want to talk about how this love affair started and what it says about black identity, perhaps even more about cultural solidarity. Again, th- th- this ain't that though.
Okay, so first, let's establish that Africans and African descended people have a very long and diverse history of martial combat practices, just like every other culture that has ever existed. This includes, but is not limited to arts that y'all probably already know, like capoeira, aka real life button mashing, and not so well known arts like dambe, aka the gnarliest sh I've ever seen since probably Muay Thai. Like, seriously, Africa is officially the continent of doing way too much at this point. Australia, y'all had a good run, but look at this. There's also arts like Hueco de Mani in Cuba and the 52 Blocks or Jailhouse Rock, all of which were developed by African slaves in the Americas. And I might just do a whole video on the 52 Blocks now that I think about it. But my point is, whether as a means of defense, of sport or fitness, Black people have always had an affinity, not just for practicing, but developing martial arts styles. Again, just like practically every other culture ever. If you've been watching this channel for any length of time, then I don't need to explain to you how big a deal self-defense was to the Black Panther Party. I mean, that's literally the reason Californians can't open carry to this day. That and the fact that their governor at the time was working with like half his frontal lobe on permanent holiday. But for as much as we make about the guns, the Panthers were just as concerned with defense through physical combat, initiating martial arts programs in cities like Newark and obviously Oakland. Okay, that's all good and dandy, but how did Kung Fu specifically become so common in black consciousness? Well, poverty. Duh, nigga. No, I'm, I'm not joking, like not at all. Like I said in past videos, the inner cities of 1970s America were basically everything politicians want you to think they are now, but like five times worse. It was practically like living in Fury Road, but with a disco aesthetic instead of a metal one, which actually does sound kind of boss, to be honest. Thus, poor people didn't really have much money to spend on the newest summer blockbuster hitting the fancy theaters downtown, but they could rub a few nickels and dime together to scrape up a few dollars for the Grindhouse Theater up the block. Now, for those of y'all like myself who thought that Grindhouse was just jive talk for a dollar movie theater or just the name of a pretty underappreciated Tarantino Rodriguez collaboration. Grindhouses were theaters often located in inner city areas that screened mostly low budget and what many might consider risque content like B movie splatter flicks and exploitation films of both the ethnic and sexual variety, sometimes both at the same time. Killing two birds with one stone, I guess. Well, in the 1970s, with Bruce Lee's rise to fame and the subsequent resurgence of the Kung Fu genre in Asia, there was potential for the genre's popularity to reach American shores. The only problem being Americans don't like to read. Might be something to do with our education system. No, jokes aside, as much as sub-only anime purists have done practically everything in their power to scare every maiden and regular bather they meet away from that genre, foreign films even today don't usually do great in American box offices because subtitles, man. So to make the films more attractive to American movie houses, the prices of those films were sold to theaters at a drastically reduced price compared to English speaking films of the time. Enter the grindhouse. Pun definitely intended. I'm a dad, man. What, what do you expect? Kung Fu films were a cheap way for these theaters to generate revenue, and many urban youths flocked to the theaters to see the likes of Master Killer and, of course, the aforementioned Bruce Lee on the silver screen. No 70s era black exploitation film was complete without a fight scene of its own, and the influence of wuxia films can be seen in movies like Superfly and Dolomite, among others. Eventually, the two genres merged and produced films like Black Belt Jones and Black Samurai, both starring black exploitation all star Jim Kelly. Speaking of Kelly wasn't just an actor, but a legit bad mofo who had already won pretty much all the karate championships by the time he was brought on to train Calvin Lockhart for his role in the 1972 film Melinda. Also, the dude was a pro tennis player. So yeah, this is literally the guy that 4chan just wished they could be and sleep with probably. It, it, it's, it's okay, bucko. Times are different now.
Kelly wound up being cast in that same film as basically himself, a martial arts trainer. This role is what opened the door for his breakthrough one in Enter the Dragon alongside Bruce Lee. And the rest is history, basically. Just like Drake's nigga pass. We don't want to hear you say Kelly's prominence in not just black, but mainstream media influenced later legit bad mofos like Michael Jai White and Blade of Wesley's theory fame. But while Kelsey, <laughs> Kelsey got eagles on the brain, man. But while Kelly got most of the flowers stateside, there was another black ass kicker who was just as popular out east, if not more so even. Ron Van Cleef, AKA the Black Dragon is a legit Fofo merchant, being an expert in both Goju Ryu style of karate as well as Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. But more impressive to me than his acting career, Van Cleef became the oldest participant in the Ultimate Fighter Championship in 1994 at the age of 51 in a losing effort, but to Royce freaking Gracie. He ultimately wound up retiring a five-time karate slash kung fu world champion and a 15-time American champion after winning the All-American Karate Championship at 60 years old and still competes in BJJ tournaments to this day. Again, F around, find out, nigga. Van Cleef's IRL badassery led to he being cast in films such as The Black Dragon, Black Dragon's Revenge, and Way of the Black Dragon. Mighty Man or Captain All Might. Ooh, I like Super All Might. <laughs> so yeah, basically a Marvel franchise. All of this he did while directing the choreography for a number of Wuxia films and training Tamiak, AKA Bruce Leroy from The Last Dragon. But while we're already here, the fact that Kung Fu tropes were so ingrained in black exploitation that we were spoofing it by the 80s just goes to show how deep an impact it had and still has on black culture and identity. The fingerprints of those grindhouse Wuxia films can be seen all over not just black cinema, but music, hip hop especially. If you got your overthinking goggles on, which are basically affixed to my brain at this point, then you'll have already gathered that Kung Fu movies started to gain popular in the inner cities right around the same time that hip hop was born in the same hospital, pretty much. So it was basically inevitable that the same dude sampling and scratching Chuck Brown records on Friday nights spent their afternoons in a matinee viewing the game of death. The same kids pop locking and top rocking were sneaking into the grindhouse on a school day to see 36 Chambers for like the fifth time. In fact, many breakdance pioneers credit the choreography and acrobatics of Wuxia films as a primary influence on their style of dance. Even the very concept of dance battles is inspired by the fight scenes from Kung Fu movies. And today, many martial arts films incorporate breakdancing into their choreography. But please, kids, don't 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 ever try to do any of this in a real fight. I, I'm speaking from experience and head trauma. And that's where I want to pause for a minute because I bet some of y'all are in the comments now saying, but isn't that appropriation? The short answer is no, but this is. This isn't to say that minorities are incapable of appropriation because yeah, exactly, man. Matter of fact, I have a tattoo of a calavera on my left tricep and I haven't so much as even been to Mexico before. Now I could always just try to get away with it by pulling my Boricua card out, but that's kind of the problem with the way that white people see Latinos now, isn't it? If not, then we wouldn't be doing the whole, well, why are Floridian Latinos voting for Trump for the second time thing again? Oh, you mean the same ones who look like Homelander and had their sugar plantations commandeered by Castro before getting a free stimulus check from the feds to rebuild on the same land that those same feds commandeered from black people, indigenous people, and black and indigenous people? Gee, I wonder why they'd rather vote for the party that wants to reclassify Henry Turtle Dove's Southern Victory series from American Lit to AP History instead of taxing the rich. For one thing, 
When we talk about appropriation between an empowered group and an underserved one, the power dynamics are completely different than when it takes place between two oppressed groups, blacks and Asians specifically, the Chinese in this instance. See, it's not an issue for non-black or Latino people to embrace hip hop or hip hop culture. The problem is when you reduce and misrepresent what you're adopting like this. Second and more important is whether or not cultural exchange is actually taking place as opposed to just adopting that foreign cultural element as your own and just living life. Like I just mentioned, B-boys and girls didn't just start doing karate kata at each other and called it breakdancing. They took elements of what they saw martial artists do and interpreted it through their own lens. Okay, so think of it like reggaeton which is very obviously and heavily influenced by hip hop and dance hall, but it is its own distinctly Latino subgenre within the hip hop umbrella or even hip hop itself, which is defined by heavy percussion, syncopations and verbal combat and even call and response, which were brought to the Americas by enslaved West Africans. What I'm saying is Chinese culture inspired Wu Tang and Wu Tang inspired Afro Samurai, or in part it did at least. MC Jin, who I mentioned in a past video, is a Chinese MC who never tried to be anything other than Chinese. He interpreted black music through his own cultural lens, which produced something unique and authentic that was honestly like 10 years ahead of his time just because we were like 20 years behind in the stereotyping department. I kick raps and spit fire, yo. He just kick and be like, hi, y'all. Dog, I know why your eyes is chinky. Cause you keep staring at my pinky. Yo, let's go, holla All right. back. All right, good run. Yo, stand that was right a good there, run. stand right there. Hey. Sorry, Jen, I, I, I really want it better for you, man. And we will come back to the whole cultural exchange bit, but first we got to get to the reason why Kung Fu Flicks connected with urban youth besides the fight scenes, which to be honest is more than enough if you ask me. Remember, one of the main reasons for black exploitation's popularity was the rarity of seeing minority actors cast in lead roles, let alone as the masculine ideal. That's where Bruce Lee comes in. I'm not gonna do the whole wiki blurb section for Bruce because if you have stuck around this long, you probably already know enough of it. Or if you don't, there's already a bunch of videos and articles and movies about him. But it suffices to say that when Enter the Dragon hit American shores in 1973, most Americans weren't used to seeing an Asian character that wasn't a dragon lady or a bad pun. Yeah, John Lewis already did a whole video on white humor. Y'all should probably go check that out after this if you want to understand why that has ever even been a thing man bruce oozed that rugged machismo that defined leading men in the time period he was in a lot of ways to kung fu what clint eastwood was to the western not just in popularity but in his character remember the westerns of the 60s and 70s were one part revival and one part revision of that genre Instead of being basically a white man's bird and power shooting gallery, films like those of the Dollars Trilogy dealt with complex depictions of morality and served as social commentary for the events of that day. During the same period in which black Americans were fighting to drink from the fountain that wasn't connected to the public toilet, the Chinese were also trudging through their own decolonization. Although the mainland had been free of imperialist Japanese rule since the in the World War II, Hong Kong was still a British colony and remained so until 1997. The 1960s in Hong Kong marked a number of demonstrations against the colonial government, including the 1966 Star Ferry hunger strike and resulting riot, and the 1967 riots would end it with over 800 people being injured and 51 dead many at the hands of the Hong Kong Royal Police. So yeah, cops are ops in every language in the world is my point. This is the backdrop upon which these films were being made. A Westerner or more specifically a 
white one to be honest we'll see the big boss for example as a simple morality tale starring generic chinese everyman who avenges his fallen family members but to someone who knows better it's the story of a simple chinese everyman standing up to the big boss it's, it's right there in the title man jesus the main villain in fist of fury is basically just Japan personified by the dojo master Hiroshi Suzuki and the themes of Japanese imperialism being all over the movie, including discrimination against the Chinese for just being Chinese. The film ends with a freeze frame of Bruce Lee's character Mig Kick as a combined Japanese and Western police force open fire upon him. Again, the theme of the everyman running headfirst in the combat against the insurmountable resources of the oppressor class. Duh, nigga. Even though he gets beat to death by Dr. Claw from Inspector Gadget, Kelly's portrayal in Enter the Dragon as an actual human being was something that most audiences during the time weren't used to seeing. Back then, black men in Hollywood were either hustlers, H addicts, or Sidney Poitier. That, that, that's basically all you got. Kelly was none of that. And to see a black and a Chinese man teaming up to take on the powers that be, well, it was probably the best thing to happen to Afro-Asiatic relations since fried chicken. That's not a joke, man. Look it up. I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious about that. More importantly, it showed two members of an oppressed cast joining forces against an oppressor. So, yeah, cultural solidarity and all that. Remember, the civil rights movement occurred just a bachelor's degree earlier, and while not nearly as strong as it was in the 60s, black power and by extension the radical identity politics that defined it were still very prominent in the black zeitgeist of that era. So when black and Asian Americans saw Lee and Williams teaming up against Han, they weren't just watching Rush Hour and Beta Phase, they were basically watching the Rainbow Coalition with flips and karate kicks. And I mean, if you don't get that from watching these films, then that's okay, especially if you're not a member of an oppressed cast. I said a few videos ago how I completely missed the messaging of Moonlight because I was still very much in the don't ask me to hold your purse phase of unlearning my own toxic masculinity. But I think viewing these films as little more than a shoestring plot to kill time in between set pieces, which I mean, let's keep it a buck, but yeah, they, they kind of are, it's still kind of reductive which gets back into the appropriation conversation, but we're not going back there for now at least. They are a message to the little guy to fight the good fight against the big bad bully. That is better to die on your feet than to live on your knees, unless your name is Jenny's heart. I, I, I got a problem, man. And I want to make clear that this was done very much on purpose. See, Lee being part white himself and growing up in Hong Kong experienced his own form of discrimination that would color his worldview until his death basically. Lee knew from a young age what it felt like to be judged by your heritage instead of your character, not just in his home country, but even when he got to the states. Lee experienced firsthand American society's affinity for emasculating Asian men. It's the Mandingo trope in reverse, basically. This is why he was passed over for the lead role in the TV series Kung Fu, a concept which, according to himself and his wife, he actually pitched to Warner Brothers. And you know who they got instead? David Carradine, a white man who is not a martial artist. The snub proved to be something of a blessing in disguise though, as this along with his frustration over the kinds of roles he was being offered, convinced Lee to move back to Hong Kong, where unbeknownst to him, he had become something of an icon thanks to his role as Kato in the Green Hornet show. Lee used his celebrity to sign a deal that produced the big boss and Fist of Fury, and yeah, the rest y'all can kind of piece together for yourself. Lee's color blindness, for lack of better phrasing, reflected in his fighting style, which is no style in his own words. Jeet Kune Do. He combined elements of Wing Chun, which he learned under the tutelage of 
the legendary Ip Man with boxing, Muay Thai, karate, even fencing apparently. I don't know how he did that, but I guess he could stab a nigga with his knuckle if need be. This is Bruce Lee we're talking about. Lee's understanding and portrayal of race relations in his movies, Enter the Dragon in particular, was informed not just from his own experience, but by those of his black students and colleagues, including Lou Alcindor himself, aka the real life Sasquatch. Neil Gaiman? What are you doing in my falafel? Now, if you know anything about Kareem, then you know he was in his time what Jay and Bay want you to think that they are. And yes, neither of them will cease catching strays until they drop the whole give us us free act finally. But Bruce didn't just rely on his big and tall section bestie to nurse him with knowledge from the black power nipple. Bruce took it upon himself to self-educate on the experience of black people in the West, according to Bao Nguyen, the director of the 2020 documentary Be Water. This is at least part of the reason why the black characters in Lee's films are portrayed in a demonstrably more tasteful way than even the black films of the same period depicted their black actors. All that said, Kung Fu movies resonated with young men in the urban centers not just for their physical masculinity. Remember, one of the oft understated goals of black power was to redefine what black man and womanhood was outside of a white supremacist framework. And while some, including groups like the US movement, looked to Africa, others looked further east. In addition to themes of resistance and decolonization, Kung Fu movies had themes of honor, loyalty, self-improvement, and discipline that were not only easily digested, but was very much in line with the overall philosophy of black power. In fact, have you noticed how the themes and philosophy of Kung Fu films are almost identical to what is arguably their biggest facilitator in black America from like the end of the crack era on. Okay, so y'all knew there was no way I could do this video without talking about Wu-Tang, right? When you think about the blending of hip hop and high jump kicks, Wu-Tang should be and probably is the first thing that comes to mind. Like, they did a whole bit about this on Chappelle's show, I think, at one point. This all took place in the slums of Shaolin. It was the rhythm, the gist. Old dirty bands with Raekwon the chef. You God inspect the deck, and of course, Method man. RZA, the de facto leader of Wu-Tang, recounts how he and Jizza would skip school and pay the local glue sniffer to buy them tickets to whatever Kung Fu flick was showing and proceeded to spend the entire afternoon there. The 1983 film Shaolin and Wu-Tang was the inspiration behind the group's name, and its English dub was sampled throughout the group's debut LP, Enter the Wu-Tang 36 Chambers, which in addition to being credited as not only reviving East Coast hip pop but being the template of it for like the next decade plus it's named after both enter the dragon and 36 chambers of the shaolin in addition to comic books and the five percenter nation that i've referenced so many times on this channel i might have to do a whole video about 90s and early aughts whole tepetry because i'm really uncomfortable with how many more white millennials than black zoomers know what daily mass mean and i blame y'all's parents the philosophy they picked up from those kung fu flicks are cited as primary inspirations behind the wu-tang ethos and by extension east coast hip-hop until the five boroughs really didn't matter outside of the five boroughs I I i'm sorry new york the fact that six nine and ice spice <laughs> are probably y'all's most recognizable export since Bodak Yellow Drop, which itself was an anomaly, if we're going to be real, is all the argument I, I, I need. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. That, that was y'all's fault for letting them get on in the first place. So, hey, West Coast got it. Specifically, RZA, Raekwon, Meth, among the 
other 2K Plus Wu-Tang members and affiliates have spoken at length about the impact that the codes of honor, loyalty, and brotherhood displayed in Kung Fu movies had on their philosophies on hip-hop. Matter of fact, considering the impact that 36 Chambers had on hip-hop culture, it's kind of hard to argue that that influence just stopped with Wu-Tang. Like, I know that this explanation is flimsier than the one SCOTUS gave for basically making the presidency a dictatorship now since rap collectives go back to basically the genre's birth but pretty much every rapper worth knowing in the 90s was a part of some kind of collective matter of fact a lot didn't get on until they joined one the locks the firm the fujis junior mafia state property g unit dipset hell if you want to count the south as the east coast which you really shouldn't you could add the hot boys in the dungeon family in there among others as well this isn't to say that rap collectives don't still exist in some form today. I mean, Dreamville and at least the corpse of our future and the dormant pathogen that is Black Hippie are still around, at least technically they are. But the idea of what being in a rap group meant became kind of diluted from the blog era on. Back in ye olden days when paying for porn was not only socially acceptable, but a rite of passage, if you were in a rap group and one of your members had beef, then you all did. Matter of fact, the story of Adidon, which I have said several times is the greatest diss track ever, was just the last chapter worth reading in the wider Neptune's cash money beef. Matter of fact, Ether and Takeover, which a lot of people have as number one and two in any order on their personal Mount Dismore, were because of Memphis Bleak. If you're younger than 30, don't worry about who that is. And if you are, you know why not to. If nothing else, the idea of fighting your brother's battles and if need be taking the bullet for him is an idea common in the martial arts and hip hop genres. Okay, so picture this, a young novice gets taken under the wing of a wizened, wily master who spends their twilight years passing down their eldritch knowledge to the young protege, only to be humbled, humiliated, and possibly homicided by a rival and or brash upstart. The protege then vows to avenge their fallen master and undertakes the prerequisite hero's journey, meeting and making a ragtag cast of friends and foes along the way before finally exacting revenge and taking on their own protege in the mid credit scene, setting up the next cinematic universe, doomed the collapse mid arc under the weight of expectation and Marvel movie dialogue. Yeah, that was the Neptune's cash money beef in a nutshell. Or, or or close enough. In this one, Luke turns to the dark side after getting his hand chopped off. Also, Leia has a BBL. Like I said in the last video, hip hop, whether some of y'all youngling or oldling alike want to admit as much, is built on friendly fades. It's built on the idea that my kung fu is stronger than yours and proving it. And the only way to do so is to practice the same kick a thousand times before it becomes as natural as nutting after the third stroke. What I'm saying is the parallels between hip hop and kung fu films was just too obvious to not at least acknowledge, if not celebrate the same way that Wu-Tang, Kendrick, and the countless kung fu flick samples have over the years. Which brings me back to Jen and the cultural exchange PC. I, I keep my word, folks. See, believe it or not, I don't have a problem with the Far East infatuation with black culture. I just have a problem with K-pop and J-Funk. The former, because it's no different than the way America whitewashes and dilutes black music for mass consumption. And the latter, because it's literally just gang-ish. Like... Call me old school, but I cringe to this day when I see golf girlies and snapback bros with teardrop tats. Like, do y'all remember a few months ago when the IG filter films on Twitter found a way to turn that whole here's the face and here's the flag trend into set tripping somehow? Like, do y'all even know how girls get jumped into gangs to begin with? Choo choo, nigga! Anyway, the reason I brought up Jen before going on that tangent slash tirade is because Jen didn't try to rap like the blacks did. 
He rapped about what he knew and what he knew was being Chinese. <laughs> and that's at least respectable and in my opinion, commendable and a worthy cultural exchange. Going as far back as the 80s, Asian Americans like Kid Fresh Ice and DJ Qbert have made their mark on the ever-growing hip-hop zeitgeist. In 2008, Jabberwockies won the inaugural season of America's Best Dance Crew, and today is the only group from that show that still matters. Anderson Pack and Far East Movement are more recent examples of Asian American hip-hop acts who have put their own spin on the formula, while Aquafina, on the other hand, culture vultured her way into an Oscar win and mainstream consciousness by using a black scent that makes me think what Fran Drescher would be like if she had a black baby daddy. And that's just the US. I really don't have the time or the knowledge, honestly, to get into the Japanese, the Korean, the Filipino, the Chinese, or the insert Far East nation here's rap scene. But despite what you may see being shared on Twitter, they pretty much been doing their own thing with the genre for the better part of the last four decades, really. And yeah, that uniqueness has given way to copycatitude in the last like five or so years. But I spent like 20 minutes of that hip hop is dead video saying that that's exactly what the black boys stateside have been doing as well. We just don't think that hard about it because they are stateside and because they are black. I put so much pussy, I might switch the pussy. The bitch is Asian and I call her for some sucky. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? And it doesn't stop with just the music. I referenced Afro Samurai earlier, but from Samurai Shampoo to deeper cuts like Devil Man Cry Baby, the influence of hip hop on anime is evident and vice versa. From Megan's thirstworthy cosplays to Akira's damn near ubiquity in the hip hop reference catalog to the very existence of the boondocks. The cultural exchange between East and West never stopped and hopefully it never does. That said, my hope is that in all the mixing and matching, the swapping and shopping of culture that we all remember at EOD, we're just guests in someone else's house. Run's house. Zoom in, Clarence. My name's not I'll be the first to say that I did have my own Donald Glover phase early enough in life and for a short enough period of time that that head ass could just be written off in the kids are dumb file of my life. I'm sorry for who follow me, chilling with a Filipina at your local Jollibee. Yeah, I'm in her ass like side of me. So if you see my hand under the table, don't bother me. But the fetish and emasculization of Asian-ness and black and specifically hip hop culture is as common as Scott McKnight. Yeah, I know that that was a bad bar, but even the great shoe air balls from time to time, just ask Cole or better yet, go try finding seven minute drill on Spotify. Burn. There's the music video for Y'all Gonna Learn Chinese, which I still believe handicapped Jin as more of a novelty than a legit MC. Y'all gonna learn Chinese. The it's all Greek to me anyway type exoticism that Nikki has shown toward East Asia over the years. And no, I'm not talking about Harajuku Barbie. Matter of fact, that persona might actually be her most informed depiction of Asianness that I know of at least. Go watch the Chun Li or the Your Love videos for reference if it's not already playing and umg hasn't blocked it i don't know man i don't edit these joints anymore yeah y'all y'all gotta take it up with babila if that does happen hey hey does anybody remember that eric sermon song with the arabic vocal sample yeah that was actually hindi and it translates to let me just check my notes real quick here if someone wants to commit suicide what can you do? Not gonna lie, knowing that now just makes this hook infinitely funnier than anybody meant it to be. Whatever she said, then I'm that. If this here rocks to y'all, then we laugh. Hey, remember that happy ending song that Hobson made a few years ago? Hey, girl, how you doing? I can give you good massage. Mega. Like, mega racist. Like, holy shit. 
Yeah, and some of y'all apparently still wonder why Kenny never bothered to clap back at a nigga whose biggest claim to fame is wearing colored contacts. Remember how I said we're all guilty of appropriation to some degree? This is what I'm talking about. Wu-Tang's homages to Kung Fu do have a slight air of exoticism to them, but in Wu-Tang's case, that's entirely due to the way that it was presented to them. If you follow Wu-Tang's catalog, you can see that as their knowledge of Kung Fu and Eastern philosophy grew, their presentation of it became more and more grounded, meaning they always have reverence for the culture even when their understanding of it was limited to movies and martial arts manuals. I can't really say that that reverence is universal and just as important for this discussion, I can't say that it's always been reciprocated. Like I referenced earlier, especially in light of Street Hop's recent revival, much of modern Asian hip hop culture is just they cosplaying an amalgamation of black Americanisms they picked up from the internet. irrespective of how, who, and where they're actually used. To the point that what they call hip hop is just AAVE struggles if it were a person, which would be infinitely more entertaining if that's what they really were going for. Like that's the thing that even a lot of Americans don't get. Blackness in ergo hip hop culture is still very much regional, despite the MM's desperate attempts to homogenize it. Like, where in America have you ever seen a black person sip and lean through a shiesty and gold fronts? When have you ever seen C's, B's, and rakes down thrown up in succession except on a Kai Sinat stream? And, and this is the nigga who said that we had no culture, by the way. When have you ever heard someone say that mark ass buster slid on my jaw in a Kentucky Fry accent? Y'all, we having a K barbecue today. You see this shit? Look at that. Sexy you see this? We got the tick tock that's where and that's kind of the point that i'm getting to this is what appropriation looks and sounds like folks in its crudest and most flippant form and no it doesn't get a pass just because it happens on both sides especially not in a country where a woman in blackface wearing a prosthetic ass is broadcast on state television alongside a nigga in a monkey suit not in a country where they literally had to censor out Chadwick Boseman's face on the Black Panther poster because nobody was going to want to see the movie otherwise. Not in a country where hundreds of African migrants were evicted from their homes based on the same kind of xenophobia that turned COVID into the China flu stateside. And worse yet, these folk were left homeless even after they tested clean. Again, my point isn't to say that appropriation doesn't happen on both sides, but it is to say that the implications are far more foreboding when it's done from a position of privilege in the social hierarchy. Like, believe it or not, I'd be saying exactly the same thing if Nollywood decided to do a retelling of Journey of the West with all African actors and actresses while imposing a poll tax on Chinese descendants, even though considering China's relationship with Africa for like the past two decades, that might actually be justified, but that's not my point. In one article I read for this video, a popular Japanese rapper said that hip hop is for everyone. Sounds like one of the comments I got on a community post a little while back. Yeah, you know who you are. It doesn't matter what country you're from or what race you are, which, if we're going to be serious, is just colonizers speak for, I like what you made, but I don't like it enough to pay you for it. And even if I disagree, I can see where they were coming from. And a lot of y'all watching might even agree with that. But let me ask you this. Would you or that rapper be singing the same tune if we were talking about Kabuki or Sumo? Why are works like the Last Airbender or Samurai Jack and especially the Boondocks not considered anime by most people despite the very obvious inspirations. And I'm not saying that they should be considered such. I'm just asking you, why is it when we talk about the colonization of black culture that suddenly everybody wants to start singing Kumbaya? Why is it that when we make something and the world decides that they want it to, it no longer belongs to us? You know why, nigga. Globalization is in a lot of ways just colonization with a gift basket. And in that basket is the cultures of conquered peoples commodified. 
Capitalism in its reliance on an exploited caste to sustain itself is unequivocally a beneficiary of white supremacy, and many would argue it perpetuates, even promotes it. I'm one of those people, folk. Like I said in the past, exploitation is just dehumanization with a blank check. It's much easier to justify stealing from someone you already think low of. The fact of the matter is, even if it's not nearly as loud, blackness is still seen as less than in much of Asia, the same way that it is in the Americas. And the fact that capitalism is the vehicle through which most Asians have been introduced to black culture means the version that they're getting has already been reduced before it even hits the shelves. Look, as much as we, and by we, I really mean me get a kick out of watching k-pop stands develop a brain bleed trying to piece together like four or five regions of black american dialect into a coherent sentence it just proves a point that i've said so many times on this channel that i'm seriously going to get it on a t-shirt the world loves everything about black people except black people Am I saying that only black and brown people can do the hippity hop? No, of course not. Even though I know the willfully obtuse among you are going to argue that very point in the comments. And to you, I say have fun barking at the mirror and chasing your own tail. It's not going to make you any less maidenless. But what I am saying is if I let you hold my car, the least you can do is fill the tank up before you bring it back. In other words, respect my house when you visit and we won't have no problems. If you have a problem, then go find your own home. And unless you're a private equity firm, good luck with that in this market. Also, eat a dick, BlackRock. Listen, I know most of y'all expected this to just be a fun little frolic into black people's infatuation and at times fetishization of Asia, specifically China and Japan. And it kind of was that until my ADHD brain couldn't find the bottom of the rabbit hole until it stopped at white people where it almost always does, just like culture. But um. And I don't want to sound like I'm lumping Asians in with the ashen ones in the appropriator tier list. I mean, y'all do actually have something to appropriate back. But it is to say that hip hop, and for that matter, the people who created it deserve the same respect that Kung Fu was given, or at least was given by those of us with sense. Furthermore, and honestly, more importantly, the mashup of East and West that is the hip hop Kung Fu connection to me is evidence of the kind of solidarity that half wits on both sides think us incapable of and the colonizers fear us ever achieving. Again, this ain't really that video, but at EOD, there's a lot more that connects than divides us. Like seriously, go 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 look up that fried chicken thing, man. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. If Jin and Wu-Tang have taught us anything, it's that when you genuinely love a culture, when your love for that culture is more than just skin deep, it compels you to learn more about the people behind the culture. It compels you to learn why they do the things they do. It compels you to learn the experience that informs that entertainment and even to empathize with it and even to allow that experience to inform your own experience. And when you do do that, when you do learn about the experience behind the entertainment, you're compelled to either leave it alone or to, I don't know, absorb yourself into said experience. And that's why I stopped watching porn folks. Yeah, I know the humorless among you are going to take issue with that, but you find another channel.